Super. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as some of you, as I told some of you, my wife's in the, um, so works in the Bay Area, so we come back every few months. So it's been awesome being able to work with Brandon and see other people at LBO whenever we come and work with Mustafa. Um, our monthly meetings have been awesome in terms of suggestions. So I just wanted to roughly introduce some of the things that we're working on in catalysis. And so my group works on a lot of different application areas, mostly on uh, various types of chemistry and inorganic materials, but also some other materials applications. So the example that I will use throughout this talk will be selective CO2 to fuels, taking things like CO2 and trying to hydrogenate them to uh, ethylene or ethanol. Ethylene is a nice high value um, input into the chemical commodities sector um, for plastics manufacturing. We're also working on water splitting, oxygen evolution materials, and um, oxide chemistry, uh, selective uh, thermal catalysis and upgrading, water desalination remediation. Um, we have some new projects on looking at how polymers and ionomers sit up platinum interfaces and how we um, study effects and oxygen diffusion. And then finally, we've been working with some collaborators at CMU on um, additive manufacturing for high entropy alloys and also high entropy alloys for catalysis. Um, it's sort of an increasingly interesting area. Uh, this is a little all over the place, but what ties everything together is how we think about the problem. Um, as Mustafa said, I did my PhD in systems engineering. I didn't do a lot of computational chemistry at the time, um, but we think about things as inputs and outputs and different transformations we're trying to do. Um, we need to be able to uh, consider a lot of different properties at the same time. Um, that's what makes these inorganic materials problems really interesting. So um, I can hypothesize some structure, maybe an ordered intermetallic that you get from the materials project or some alloy or something else. The things that we often care about, the properties that come up a lot are thermochemical descriptors. Small molecules sitting on the surfaces tend to correlate with the selectivity and the activity. Um, these thermochemical descriptors are not usually available in the inorganic databases um, that are currently online, like materials project and OQMD. We're also interested in the stability of the interface. Um, uh, kinetics in the term in the form of transition state calculations is really the gold standard, but the most expensive thing. And this ends up being quite an interesting problem for surface engineering because we want to satisfy multiple properties at the same time and it becomes a little hierarchical. And I'll tell a little bit how those things fit together. So an ideal scenario is um, we're considering different materials and we want to find all of the bulk materials that we can actually synthesize. And on all of those, I want to say, what are the actual facets that would show up if I were to just make some nanoparticles? And then I want those facets to be stable under reaction conditions. And I want them to be active and selective for the chemistry. Um, and then if you have microkinetics, you can also make some predictions on maybe what is the optimal temperature or pressure to be running at at the same time. So there's a lot of different properties here that we need to be able to calculate. Um, and so the way that we do this is uh, by thinking first about what is the design space of all the materials we're interested in. Catalysis is super broad. There's different subsets of people doing uh, metal organic frameworks, uh, oxides, 2D materials, ordered alloys like intermetallics, disordered solid solutions. Each of those sort of a family, you have to work very closely with people to say what is synthesizable and what do you actually need to worry about. Um, as a systems engineer, uh, we first develop the space and then you can choose anything in that space for calculations depending on the properties, it might be DFT or molecular dynamics or um, whatever, depending on how much entropy we need to consider. And we wanna calculate things like adsorption energies or stabilities um, or other properties. And so the first place that machine learning comes into this, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, is you can bridge density functional theory, which is very expensive, and molecular dynamics, which is very cheap, but a little bit coarser and has some parameterization problems with these things called machine learning force fields. And so I'm not going, going to go into a ton of detail, um, but uh, the interesting problems in this machine learning force field space are really how you make them robust and usable and how you um, especially start them with small data. And so as an example, um, this is some work that one of my students, Muhammad, did. Uh, this is a little toy calculation we're doing of CO bouncing around on a copper surface. Um, looks pretty good. Um, the CO stays together. The copper jiggles around a little bit. We have fixed the bottom two layers, so that's why they're not moving. Um, no problem. 
And if I take the first 100 snapshots from this trajectory, and I train a machine learning force field, a standard Baylor Perinola one, um, the mathematics of which has been around for 12 years now, um, nothing fancy, and then project forward, things go off the rails right away, right? There's nothing in the data set that says that the copper has to stay together. Um, there's nothing that says that the coppers can't really overlap. Um, the COs sort of fly off the surface um, and have this really crazy um, stretch frequency that is definitely unphysical. And this makes it really, really complicated to fit these things in an online framework because if you're trying to sample from this distribution, I can't even, I can't even get DFT to converge in those places, right? If you have two atoms overlapping, you're not even gonna be able to solve the electronic structure problem. Even if you do solve the problem and you add the data, that's probably gonna poison your data set. Um, and those aren't things that you actually need to care about. Um, I don't need energies in my data set that say two atoms overlapping are super high energy. So um, practically what this means is um, we're fitting things from some distribution, little red points from this uh, Leonard Jones distribution, for example, um, around some thermal um, distribution, Boltzmann, whatever. And when we train the machine learning potential, there's nothing in there that says how it should extrapolate. And so um, it goes off pretty quickly. The thing that's really scary is on the left-hand side, this machine learning potential doesn't have, um, doesn't have a continuous increase as you overlap. And so this is what it's saying, it's okay to overlap two atoms together, it really doesn't know. And what we found is incorporating just the smallest amount of physics into this, um, adding a simple uh, classical potential at the very beginning that says, um, there are some things like van der Waals and Morse potentials, and if you overlap two things, you're going to have a problem. Um, we know the covalent radii, so we don't even have to like really fit many of these parameters. Even using that with the same procedure, um, we get much better convergence. So the CO is still flying off the surface, but the copper looks very reasonable now, and any point from there, I could actually sample and add back to the training data set. Um, so a lot of the work here is not in building the new potentials, it is how to make these things robust and stable and um, the online active learning process. This is uh, work that we're doing with Andy Peterson at Brown as part of the open source um, atomistic machine learning potential AMP package. And this is uh, a project that's being funded by one of the computational chemical sciences programs in DOE, um, trying to push to exascale. Okay, so the other place that machine learning comes in is how we actually use these uh, um, the design materials. And so what I really want to do is I want to find the next set of materials to try or make some suggestions for other things I should um, consider instead of the materials that I was originally focusing on. And so the second obvious place that machine learning comes in is if I've seen enough examples of things from the design space and their properties, this becomes a nonlinear regression problem and we should be able to short circuit the whole thing and um, use this to help drive how we're selecting the next data points to add. Um, sort of avoid the obvious things or things that we could have predicted just based on what was already in the data set. So um, as an example for CO2 electrochemistry, um, at the anode, we're taking water and we're splitting it to make oxygen. And at the cathode, we want to take CO2 and hydrogenate it or reduce it to something interesting. And specifically, we don't want it to just form a bunch of hydrogen from water splitting. That's a waste of the electricity. Um, the chemistry is quite straightforward. Um, but this is a really challenging problem because uh, selective chemistry is hard. There's a lot of different hydrocarbons that we can make. Um, this is also hard because people have already experimentally brute forced the problem in terms of single cathode composition. And so there was an awesome set of papers um, uh, decades ago now where they went through and they just tried making the cathodes out of lots of different possible materials. If you make the cathode out of any of these, you bubble off a lot of hydrogen which is good for making hydrogen, but bad for hydrogenating CO2. If you use zinc or gallium or gold or silver, you have um, it's, uh, a lot of CO production. Uh, you can make formate with um, titanium or lead or tin. And the only one that's halfway interesting for C1 or C2 products is copper. And so this is interesting because it, um, this isn't a matter of finding the next best element, right? We already know what the elements are gonna do. Um, and an obvious place to start with is to say, what is special about copper? And could we find other things that are not copper, like some alloy that might be interesting and have some uh, interesting properties? So uh, people have already studied CO2 reduction on copper surfaces. This is uh, CO2 reduction on a step going to methane, a very simple pathway. 
Um, make CO2, hydrogenate it, hydrogenate it again, and you lose water, hydrogenate, 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 eventually you get a methane off. Relatively simple pathway. When you do the kinetics, what you see is that the CO to CHO step is usually the rate limiting one. And so um, this says that one, these two intermediates are interesting. And if you really examine the transition state, um, it is a little bit closer to the CO than it is to the CHO. And so this really implicates the CO adsorption energy in the overall kinetics of this pathway. So an obvious thing to do is to say, does CO adsorption correlate with what people know experimentally on CO2 reduction? So on the x-axis is the CO binding energy, the free energy. On the y-axis is either um, predicted microkinetic rates or experimental rates in those little blue triangles. And what we see is that there's a cluster of points over the right-hand side, that's silver and gold with really weak CO binding. You make CO, CO doesn't want to stick around, it leaves. On the left-hand side, CO really wants to stick around to the point that you can't do anything interesting with it. And so you eventually poison your surface. And those are all the materials that just make a bunch of hydrogen. And so copper is sort of in this privileged space where it has a very small and slightly negative CO binding energy. And so this is um, what I would consider a necessary but not sufficient condition at this point for finding a new material. Um, if I find other materials in here that have this property, um, I don't think all of them are going to be experimentally awesome. But I can tell you that the ones out here and the ones out here are probably not going to be interesting and we shouldn't be spending experimental time testing those. Okay, so I asked my first uh, PhD student, Kevin, to uh, start with the database from the materials project and go and find all of the stable bulk inorganic materials from all of these elements in gray. And we've also added carbides and sulfides and some other materials since then. Um, this is one class of materials ordered in metallics. Um, in catalysis, you can also have solid solutions, usually when it's not quite, um, uh, not quite as equimolar, more like 90% one, 10% the other. Um, if these things are stable enough, there are people who really like doing synthesis of these materials. And so uh, you can ask someone to actually go and make this specific nickel gallium um, intermetallic. Uh, it's a very nice space of compounds to play around with. And again, because the materials project people and OQMB and Aethelib have already done such an awesome job of collecting different materials and databasing them and saying what is predicted to be stable, we don't have to solve that problem, right? We already know, uh, we have some ideas of what is feasible um, to think about. So what is different from the bulk material side is just how complex this gets when we consider surface chemistry. So um, if I pull all of the stable things or near stable things from the materials project of those elements, I get about 10,000 different bulk crystal structures, maybe a little bit more depending on what your limits of stability are. And if I consider different low index facets, um, a lot of these intermetallics are missing most of the symmetry that we think about in solid uh, single component metals. Uh, we have about 200,000 different surfaces. So that's already up by about a factor of 20. If we then think about how to place a molecule on a surface, we can um, do some math in order to figure out what are the interesting symmetry reduced sites. And again, people in materials project, um, PyMagen does an awesome job of this. There's some other similar packages. Um, when we get to that level, we end up with about 15 million different um, sites that we can consider from the space. And so the surface chemistry problem is so hard because um, things that you can brute force at the bulk composition level, like let's just ask DOE to let me run on a bunch of machines and just try and calculate all the properties. Right from the beginning, um, we're going to have challenges. And I haven't even started talking about all the different chemical pathways that you can have, all the possible hydrocarbons, and also their additional degrees of freedom of how you rotate the thing around. Um, so we've been trying to deal with some of these. Um, I would say the stuff that we do is um, a first step, but imperfect. But we've been trying to move in, in this direction. So it's like, is, is there yes. a notion of a global minima of sorts that you're trying to aim for, or families of global minima? Yes. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, really what we want is the global minima of um, the molecular uh, position and rotational degrees of freedom um, with respect to the energy. Right? We want to optimize that. And so one way you can do this is you pick a surface and you run some global optimization method like basin hopping as long as you can until you find the absolute best one. 
The other approach is you consider all the possibilities and make a prediction for all of them and then find the minimum from those. Um, I am reasonably confident we can do that in terms of where we put something on the surface. I do not know how to do that with the additional degrees of freedom from rotational um, or swinging things around. If you have any ideas, I am 100% open. Uh, that space is just so large. I'm, it, we're still trying to figure that out. Okay. Um, so the approach I've taken, I would say, is uh, definitely influenced by what I've seen from the materials project. Um, I knew Anubhav um, when we were on the same DOE fellowship. I remember seeing all of his presentations on the workflows that he was building to make those things possible. So I will just talk a little bit about how um, we've been solving some of these things for surface science. Um, otherwise, I think the stuff we've been doing is very similar. Um, one difference is right from the beginning, we started with the idea that we would have to use active learning. Um, we weren't going to be able to generate this huge data set. Okay, so um, surface chemistry involves a lot of different steps, just like bulk material properties. We need to do a lattice relaxation if our calculation settings are a little bit different from the materials projects to get the lattice constant correct. We then need to cut the surface and do a relaxation. We need to analyze the surface and say, um, where can I put an adsorbate? So in this case, there's three unique sites. And then we need to put the adsorbate down and we need to do a final relaxation. And so there's multiple calculations that all have to get orchestrated together. Um, the adsorption energy that we calculated at the very end is this structure minus the blank one minus wherever the hydrogen is coming from. So relatively straightforward. So the way that we've been doing this is um, with another layer on top of fireworks to basically orchestrate these dependencies. Um, the one we're using is based on the Luigi workflow system from Spotify. Um, it has some nice properties, I think, in terms of how you define these uh, individual nodes, um, but also a lot of similarities with how things happen with Atomate and other ones. Um, it's a little bit different in that everything works backwards. You don't have to have a fixed workflow system, um, a fixed forward workflow. The idea is, Every one of these modules you define as um, a set of three Python functions that first says, if I want to run this task, how do I say what this needs? And if I have all my prerequisites, what do I do to run? And finally, um, what am I going to produce so that someone can check at the very end if I ran or not? And so you write these three little independent steps, and then you ask for something at the end, and it traverses backwards in order to find the calculations that need to run. But again, in terms of workflows, very similar. Um, this is all open source. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ping me offline. Okay, so when we started this, there weren't really large surface science data sets available for these descriptors. So the thing that I wanted to do was predict CO and hydrogen adsorption energies across inorganic materials. And um, the data sets were just really, really, really small. And so what we've done is um, we've done about 100,000 calculations ourselves across different materials and surfaces and structures. We've also done um, cleavage energy or stability calculations for a lot of these inorganic materials because I really need to know this for nanoparticles. Um, and the materials project had those for pure elements, but um, it's an additional challenge to do it for uh, bimetallics. And both of these are fully automated. If you want the data sets, um, they're on GitHub alongside all the papers, or email me and I'm happy to give them to you, or email Brandon, he has most of them as well. Okay, so um, we have surface science data sets now that help us answer these questions in catalysis. Um, those didn't exist before. Uh, the next thing is we need to be building better models for things like CO and hydrogen adsorption energies, especially as the number of data increases. Um, and so I would say this is uh, the steps we're taking are the next step in a very long progression of structure property relationships and catalysis. So the goal is we look at the surface with the adsorbate and we want to make a guess for what is the adsorption energy, right? Standard structure property relationship. And um, the thing that really drove the field forward 20 years ago was realizing that um, there's a reason why different materials bind adsorbates differently. And in a lot of cases, you can think about what is the um, electronic structure of the surface, like the D-band center, um, and how is that going to change how you bind things? If you modulate the D-band center, you change the binding energy. Um, and so the idea was you, do, you look at a surface, you calculate the D-band center, and then basically off of that D-band center, you make your prediction for what the adsorption energy is. 
this is awesome in that it tells you what's important. And it works really well for pure metals where there's only one D-band center and it's the same for all of the elements. But this breaks down if you have bimetallics and getting this thing requires a DFT calculation. So it doesn't really help us in screening a lot of materials. It's more on the understanding what's happening. So um, other people obviously recognize that this is a problem and there was a great sequence of papers in developing coordination based approaches and things like the generalized coordination number to explain how the activity changes as a function of how under coordinated the surface atoms were. This works awesome if you have a single metal. So if you're just dealing with platinum and you're trying to figure out what is the activity of a structured platinum interface, these things work great. Um, nobody really has a model that works across different elements um, in the same way. I don't know what the equivalent of a coordination number for a bimetallic is where two different components have different numbers of neighbors. Right? That's, a, that's a hard problem. And so the last approach is uh, if you have enough data, you can eventually just let the machine learning method come up with its own idea of surface descriptors and focus on those. Um, and so that's the approach that we've been taking. So all of this is um, hinged on the idea that you can take a um, atomic structure that we're interested in and turn it into a graph. This is motivated by the, um, the Grossman paper that came out two years ago, the CGC and N original one. Um, that was the first one for inorganic materials. We saw it, we thought it looked interesting. It wasn't clear if it was gonna work for surface chemistry. So you take the structure, you turn it into a graph. Every edge is a bond and you have some bond properties. Every node is an atom and you also have some atomic properties that you think are gonna be correlated like atomic radius and electronics and um, number of electrons and whatever else you think is interesting. Um, this is the work that um, the NESAP program is helping with now and Brandon has been helping with. Uh, he's been working on um, building optimization tools to identify how we build these models and tune them, which I think is going to be really helpful moving forward. Okay, so we have this graph and we need to turn this into a, um, into a vector problem, a standard nonlinear regression one. And so the way that you can do that is with graph convolutions, which are a new class of methods in machine learning. Um, you define an operation where every atom looks at its neighbors and it tries to mix the neighbor's properties with itself and update itself. So if I was that carbon, I look at all the things I'm bound to, like the oxygen and two, two coppers or whatever, and I try and mix those things together. Uh, I do that a few times, and then I try and get each one of these atoms to make a guess on their total contribution to the adsorption energy. And then I average or sum all those things together in one final pooling operation. Fairly standard approach. Um, looks a little complicated in terms of diagram, but pretty easy to implement in something like TensorFlow. Um, what has been really interesting to me is that um, my assumption in most of these is that uh, the problem is usually already well solved on the computer science side, because usually we're about 10 years behind them in terms of like what they think is interesting. These graph convolution models are very, are very topical. And so there's an entire library now of different convolution operations in PyTorch. Um, people are trying all sorts of different things. Um, the one that Grossman tried two years ago, I would say is embarrassingly simple, but works really well. There's an obvious question of what other convolution operations should we be trying and how else should we be optimizing this architecture? Uncertainty in these models is not clear. If you talk to the computer scientists, um, I haven't met anyone who says that they think this is an easy problem right now. Um, generative models for graphs are super topical. Optimization of these graph structures after the fact to try and improve some property. Um, also a very topical computer science problem. And so if I just look at this, uh, this convolution library and go to the GitHub page, um, the readme has um, about two pages like this of different papers that they've implemented. They just went around and pulled as many things from NIPS and other places as possible and implemented them in code. Most of the fundamental operations are very similar. And um, what is fascinating is one, how many there are, right? It's not like there are five different things to choose from, but there's a, a whole suite. And the second thing is um, I've highlighted the two oldest ones in this, in this uh, collection, and they're 2016, right? So this is not like stuff that was done 10 years ago. This is stuff that the computer scientists are trying to beat each other on and improve very, very quickly. Um, in the past couple of years. So this is uh, moving really, really, really quickly right now. 
Thanks. Yes. Question. So I guess uh, <coughs> in, in the process of uh, deciding on graph as being the representation of structure, right? I guess is there any chemical property or any material property that you lost out in swiping, or you feel like yes. everything related to this? No. Class will be no. Uh, one hundred percent, we have lost. Um, and so the major limitation right now, and I think the thing that's going to change is um, the way that people are building these models right now, for the most part, but not all, is um, you have some bond features, but you don't really have anything that says what are the angles or where exactly are those atoms nearby. Um, there's one, uh, one method called Schnett by um, Klaus Robert Mueller's group and others in Germany uh, that looks like this and um, is capable of getting energies and forces, but the way that they represent the atom features um, doesn't scale very well with the number of elements. Um, so if I ask this one, what is the derivative of the energy with respect to moving one of these little atoms, I don't think it's going to get the right answer. And so if I had to guess, the major thing that needs to come is um, incorporating the right symmetry functions or the right properties or radial basis sets or whatever you want to call them, such that uh, we can recognize that there's reasons why different elements interact and we maintain the properties that allow us to get energies and forces. Right now, the field is sort of bifurcated in machine learning force fields that don't scale with elements and graph convolutions that don't do energy and forces, but there's no fundamental reason why those won't come together. I think that's gonna happen. Do you have a sense for how <clears throat> large these graphs are gonna get in all forms of interest to you? Uh, sure, well, I mean, for surface properties, We've been keeping things small just because DFT is slow, but a very typical number is 50 atoms. Um, and this is a cyclic graph. Things go off the edge here and connect back around. But if I had my way and I could do um, defects or grain boundaries, I can make this thing as big as I want. Um, the only reason we've been keeping them to 60 is because I can get that to work in 20 hours um, on a computer. But I wish I could do more. Yeah. Uh, these are small compared to the computer scientists. The graphs sometimes they talk about are like um, 2 billion people on Facebook and how they are all liking each other, right? That's a very different problem. Okay, um, so this is, uh, this is moving really quickly in catalysis. We were the first ones to do this for adsorption energies, but a lot of other people are trying different variations now. So this is picking up. Um, this is an example of um, this paper from last year just predicting adsorption energies from that same data set of CO and hydrogen energies that I showed you. Um, our previous models based on me and Kevin sitting down and trying to featureize the, the surface, um, or this sort of dash line at about 0.2. These new models are doing quite a bit better. I would say we're sort of approaching the DFT accuracy level where I don't really trust the DFT calculations that much anymore, or there's numerical problems in how we're converging things that lead to some jiggle at that, at that level. Um, because we trained everything as atomic contributions, we can go back and ask, what is the contribution of each atom to this property? And so if a CO is sitting on top of the copper, the copper lights up. If it's sitting in this bridge, these two light up, but the ones nearby also seem to matter. I would not say this is like super transparent, but at least we can tell why it is making the prediction it is and go back and look at that individual atom. Okay. Um, I really want to stress that the accuracy that we're showing here, um, I would say is the best that people have shown across such a wide range of materials and surfaces, but I don't actually think it was due to the magic of the model. I think really what happened was um, we were the first ones to push the data set size large, and then we benefited off of that. So um, this was a table from the paper. Um, we tried to find all the ones from the past five years that we could different people doing different structure property relationships. Um, most of these are in the like 100 to 900 calculation data set range. And these are PhD students sitting down and doing a bunch of calculations on different metal surfaces, not automated high throughput. Um, this one is all single element compositions. Um, so large, but not particularly diverse. Um, ours was another factor of 40 over those. And in the past year, there's been another one or two data sets that have come out larger um, at the like 50 to 100,000 data set size um, regime. So there is a transition happening in catalysis right now from really small data problems to, I don't know what you want to call it, medium-sized data, maybe. Um, 
we are behind the small molecule people and the inorganic bulk materials people who have had large data sets to train on for a much longer period of time. So if you wanna do things in this area, you either have to wait for someone to generate the data or you have to take ownership and say, I'm just gonna go ahead and do this and generate the data I need. So that's what we've been doing. Okay, we can do the same thing for surface properties. Um, I'm not gonna call this a surface energy because we have not solved the um, asymmetric inorganic materials problem. Um, the cleavage energy is if you have an, um, an inorganic material and you do the cut, you end up with an asymmetric top and bottom. And the cleavage energy is basically the average of those two surface energies. If I am interested in what the shape of a nanoparticle looks like, really what I need is the individual surface energy of each of these sides. Some of these things are so unstable, we can still use this to get an idea of which low index facets might be interesting. But we are starting to get into the point where this is really a material scientist problem that I wish someone else would just solve. So if you have ideas, please, uh, please let me know. Uh, we're trying, but uh, this is really hard. Anyways, um, we can do calculations. We can collect this, um, these cleavage energies. Uh, there's a standard procedure. You do three different thicknesses. You extrapolate back to zero um, thickness, and you get this uh, cleavage energy. Um, basically, the same CGCNN model that worked for bulk inorganic materials also seems to work for surfaces with just a little bit of tweaking. That was very interesting. Um, if I take those cleavage energies and I just blindly assume that they are surface energies and put them into this little nanoparticle construction tool. Um, DFT, these are three different crystal structures that I had cared about for different chemistries in the past. Um, DFT says this new galleon is all 110 and the machine learning model agrees. That one is easy, that one's actually symmetric. Copper aluminum, qualitatively we're close. Copper gold, we're pretty close. There's just an additional facet here. But this seems to be good enough at the level of um, if I'm thinking about a hypothetical inorganic surface, should I consider it for catalyst activity or not? Is there some reasonable chance that if someone mixes these things together and forms some nanoparticles, am I gonna get any surface that looks like that? Okay. Um, I mentioned that we can predict things, but I haven't talked at all about uncertainty. And you need uncertainty if you're gonna do anything halfway optimal in terms of how you're choosing the next data point any sort of um, active design of experiments process. And so um, it is clear on a parity plot, we want things to be accurate, close to the parity line, not inaccurate, far away. That property is obvious. Um, it is unclear how to do this in graph convolution methods. So we've been playing around with different things. This is collaborative work with people in the computer science department, um, a postdoc, uh, Willie Nieswanger and Eric Shane, who's faculty in uh, CS. Um, this was just accepted this morning. Um, so we can take something that looks like one of these uh, simple CGCNN models and we can predict an energy. And the approach that you see over and over in literature is you train the same model five times against different subsets of the data, um, bootstrap, and look at the ensemble and calculate the standard deviation and use that to give you some idea of how you're doing. And so that's the easiest thing. That was the first thing we tried. Um, you can ask how calibrated are these results, but you need to be a little precise on calibration. And so there's multiple properties that you have to consider when you start getting into this uncertainty calibration. So um, the top one is just, we want the model to be accurate. If you propose a new model that is inaccurate, that is bad, um, even if it gives you uncertainty estimates. Uh, the second thing is you can do a calibration curve you can say how calibrated are the error estimates? What is the distribution of the error estimates compared to the distribution of the residuals? And so we want things to be calibrated in that there is a reasonable chance that the uncertainty bars actually cross the parity line is basically what that is telling you. This looks close enough, but it's not. And it turns out that you can come up with a perfectly calibrated model, one that is exactly on this diagonal if you fit identical <coughs> uncertainty estimates to all of your data, and you do it just so, so that this thing is perfect. You can make a calibrated model that does not actually tell you anything about what the data is doing by just making, by fitting basically this special um, standard deviation. And so you need to incorporate other things into this, like what is the dispersion of the uncertainty? The dispersion is an idea of how wide is the distribution? 
you want that to be really wide because that's telling you that some data has lower uncertainty than others. And I want to know which ones I trust and don't trust. This one that is bad shows up as a single peak on this dispersion relation. So there's multiple properties that you have to worry about here. And these are things that you need to be really careful about when you're calibrating these things. Okay. So um, in this paper, what we did was uh, we talked to people in computer science, we read papers, we tried to just come up with as many ideas of uh, estimating uncertainty as possible. Um, I think we got most of the obvious ones. Um, you take all the dense layers and you make them Bayesian neural networks. Um, you pick the energy with one model and you try and pick a standard deviation with another. Um, you use a second model um, that has some easier fingerprints and use that to predict uncertainty. Um, you use these easier fingerprints that we were using before and just build a Gaussian process, which gives you uncertainty by default. Um, we also included dropout as another one. Um, the one that ended up doing the best for this adsorption energy data set is this thing that we were calling um, PFGP, which basically says we're going to fit the model to energies. And then afterwards, we're going to go and rip off the final convolution layer and feed that directly into a Gaussian process. So we are basically using CGCNN to come up with a better set of fingerprints. And then afterwards, we do a very standard Gaussian process approach afterwards. Um, so all of the statistics and data sets are in there. If you're interested, go and look at the paper or shoot me an email or talk to Brandon or whoever. The, uh, yeah. The, uh, Interpretation of the source of uncertainty is very different in, in, I think, in all of these models. I guess the one that you're choosing to be the best, is it a physical interpretation of where the uncertainty comes from? Uh, I cannot give you a physical interpretation besides um, it happens to be the same features that made it easy for it to predict the adsorption energy. And so those two features are being shared. But um, we have not gone back and looked at exactly what things are lighting up or what specific atomic properties are causing those things to happen. Is that, um, is that important to you? Um, it's interesting, uh, especially interesting in that it might give you some ideas to why it's failing or things that you should improve or other properties you should be considering. Uh, the actual process of how do I choose the next set of materials um, uh, the demands for that, the time scale is a little bit shorter. And so we tend to get a model that works and an uncertainty method that works and run with it. But if you want to go back and make things better, I think you have to ask that question. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So we have models and we have uncertainties. And so the last thing is um, we can do uh, design of experiments. So as I said, this paper with uncertainties just came out. So we are working now on doing more rigorous DOE. Um, this is with the same postdoc, Willie, and Jeff Schneider, who's in the Robotics Institute. He was one of the people that Uber hired when they came to Pittsburgh. Um, he had fun, and now he's back. <laughs> um, this is actually a really interesting design of experiments problem because it's hierarchical. It is not a standard um, optimize some properties of a material and just find the best material for a single property. Um, and so what I mean by hierarchical is um, at the single surface level, I want to answer the question that you were asking about what is the best binding energy on a surface of all the possible locations. And so this is basically a Bayesian, um, a Bayesian statistics problem. You have different uncertainty estimates. You're trying to come up with the best estimate on the overall minimum binding energy from all of those. Okay. This is what we do at the surface level. You go one step up and you have a crystal with a bunch of different facets. And somehow you need to make an argument on what is the overall activity of this nanoparticle going to be. So I could weight it based on the, um, the area <laughs> estimate that we get from one of those world constructions. I could take them all equal. I could say, give me the best possible facet. And maybe that's the one that I would take to an experimentalist and say, make a single crystal and try and do that thing. And at the top level, um, the thing that I really care about is a set of all the materials that are predicted to be interesting. Um, and those are the ones that I want to take to an experimentalist and say, why don't you try these things? I don't really have enough trust in these calculations to say, like, if my model says one crystal is going to be a little bit better than the other, there's so many other things going on in the experiments that I don't actually know what's going to happen. But I want to give them a list of things that I think there's something interesting will happen. 
and make sure that I exclude everything that is obviously really bad. And so this is a level set estimation problem. Um, so this is what we're working on now. We don't have results, but if you have uncertainty, you can combine these things together in a rigorous fashion. Okay. We published a paper two years ago where we basically addressed this problem with 100% heuristics, just randomly trying stuff or just randomly choosing sites that were the best. Um, it was not even close to being optimal in the data, but we were able to find a lot of different materials that are sort of in this narrow CO binding range that I said was gonna be interesting and close to copper. And interestingly, about half of the ones in that region have copper and about half of them have no copper whatsoever. So those are maybe the even more interesting ones to follow up on. We had about 150 different materials that looked good. We had about another 1,500 that um, were predicted to be good with the models that we had, but we didn't have DFT calculations to verify. But if we wanted to go back and check, um, hopefully some of those would also turn out to be interesting. And again, the uncertainty or the, um, the errors that I was showing were about plus or minus 0.2 EV. And so what this says is that the model is good enough to say, am I in this band or am I far from it? I don't need the model to be 0 0.001 EV. Um, I just need it to be good enough to say, I don't need to consider this entire piece. And so it's important to sort of keep your eye on the ball in terms of the actual engineering decision that's getting made with choosing these materials. So we can go and analyze different um, combinations. Um, and the upper right, these are things that we confirm with DFT. In the bottom left, these are things that we predicted with ML. Anything that is white, is a bimetallic combination that the materials project said um, they don't have a stable crystal structure for, or if they did have one, we weren't able to get to converge with our own settings. And so I think it's sort of interesting how much white space there is in composition. Um, this is a very topical problem. Our experimental collaborators are making a lot of things in white space and then asking us what's happening and we have to, we have to solve that now. Um, this little purple box, nickel gallium, um, this was something that came out of the screen that I spent a better part of a year as a postdoc doing um, calculations by hand, trying to figure out why it was interesting for CO2 production. And so it was at least a little comforting that it was able to pick up on that specific nickel gallium 110 facet that I was able to find um, as a student doing things by hand. Okay, so we took all of these um, materials. We tried to find the groupings that were most likely to be interesting. So this is a really simple TC visualization, trying to cluster based on composition. These islands, for example, um, these are two islands that are all copper or aluminum. And we want things to be in this purple range. Purple range. It's okay to be white, it's bad to be black. And so these islands basically say, no matter how you make a copper aluminum alloy, no matter what facet you choose, all of the sites look interesting, right? There's no site on there that is gonna be so strong that it poisons the surface. And so if I had to go to an experimental collaborator and say, why don't you try and make something? I would point to this one and say, start with the one where you might get lucky no matter what happens. We have a large number of different copper containing compositions and other ones like lithium silicon and copper tin that also look quite interesting. We took this list to Ted Sargent's group at the University of Toronto and um, they tried a bunch of these. And I think we got a little bit lucky on this. Um, Copper aluminum turned out to be very active and very selective for making ethylene. Um, I think we were lucky because nothing in the models I showed you said that we should make ethylene. All I can say is that it's probably going to make some C1 or C2 product and not make hydrogen. Um, I wish I could predict that selectivity. That's things that we're working on now, but that's really hard. Um, and so this is a world record CO2 to ethylene efficiency at about 80%. Um, it's not quite where you need for an industrial process because you still have a separations problem afterwards. But this is starting to get close to the point where you can think about um, economics and it might not be too unfavorable. So um, this will hopefully be out this year. Um, hopefully soon. It's been dragging on for a long time. Okay. Um, we can do the same thing for oxides. Um, there's another set of challenge for these oxide materials and that there's many different polymorphs, some of which are in the databases like OQMD and Materials Project, some of which have not been considered. And there's an additional challenge in that because they're oxides and we're usually considering oxygen chemistry or we're, there's a bunch of water around, there's a lot of different terminations that you can have also. It can be bare with a bunch of coordinated metals, exposed metals. 
You can be oxygen terminated. You can be OH terminated. Which one of those you get depends on where you are under reaction conditions and which one's the most stable. So you have to be able to consider this additional degree of complexity if you want to move to oxide materials. And that's on top of all the complications on how do you even model oxide um, electronic structure. So this gets really, really complicated. Um, this is work that Soyan, um, the first postdoc in my group, was doing. Um, we built a workflow for iridium oxide polymorphs. Uh, we showed that similar graph convolution methods can help us predict what is the stable termination and what is the best site or the energy of oxygen or OOH at different places. Um, and we were able to rationalize why different titanium oxide polymorphs um, can have different activities. Um, so one of the ones that we found, uh, this iridium um, IRO2, looks a lot like one of the ones that was implicated for an IRO3 system after you leach out some of the materials. Um, that was an experimental paper from Stanford. Again, this is like another level of complexity on top of everything else. Um, if you're rigorously gonna say, I want to discover mixed metal oxide catalysts um, or mixed metal um, uh, perovskites or whatever else you wanna do, you have to start thinking about these coverages. And so, um, this is just where the field needs to move. We're trying to take things one step at a time. Okay, so wrapping up, um, there's some obvious directions where this is going. Uh, we wanna be able to do multi-objective optimization at the same time, either some pre optimal solution or some sort of qualitative um, constraints or trade-offs. Working with experimentalists to come up with new constraints. Um, there are some people at CMU who have high throughput uh, nanoparticle chemistry systems that we can compare against. So those data sets are sort of new and I think will hopefully be interesting. Uh, better structural property relationships and the data sets that feed them. Um, everything I've talked about is the same two simple CO and hydrogen descriptors or oxygen or whatever, but um, we need to be able to scale across chemistry if I'm gonna predict if I make ethylene or ethanol. And so that's the next big challenge. Um, and finally, uh, we want to incorporate more detailed models um, uh, and calculations in the discovery process. And by this, I mean, I don't just want to do a calculation of a bare CO sitting on a surface. I want to have solvent effects or cation effects or um, something else that comes from an implicit salvation model or a hybrid model or whatever you want to call it. Um, there are this physics that we know we're missing and we need to add those things in. Okay, so um, with that, um, I just need to thank a lot of people who have helped. Um, specifically, I wanted to point out Brandon because he's here and he's doing awesome. Uh, so Yin uh, was the first postdoc working with me. Uh, he just started a position in Korea in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Sogang University. He is awesome to work with. If you have questions about oxide materials or complicated things, um, he is just super friendly and moves unbelievably fast. Um, Terry is a PhD student in my group who's interested in doing a, um, a summer internship or summer research project somewhere in the field of informatics and materials or catalysis or something. So we're looking for a position for her. And um, Amish is a master's student who just graduated from CMU. He has a green card. Um, he's awesome. He's leading a project on additive manufacturing with high entropy alloys. And he's looking for a one year position um, to sort of bridge a PhD. I, I keep on telling him he should just do a PhD, but he won't listen to me. <laughs> and so, um, He's interested in something like this. He's been applying to places like Oak Ridge and PNNL. Um, if you know of something that might fit for these sort of skills, uh, let me know afterwards. Um, a lot of the stuff we do is only possible because of the awesome things that were done for materials project and PyMetGen. Um, the PyMetGen workflows for surface chemistry have gotten really, really, really good. And I'm really happy with how well those work. Um, NERSC has been amazing. All of the workflows we use run at NERSC. The database is run there. Um, if Wahid was charging me, the going rate for commercial rates um, for Mongo databases, I would be broke two years ago. <laughs> um, that's really been phenomenal. Um, super, super, super helpful. Um, lots of different funding sources, mostly DOE, but also for other people, um, and then various experimental collaborators. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, if anything else comes up, feel free to shoot me an email afterwards. Um, so, okay, my interest in this is like mostly from like methods and, yeah. and, and property related stuff. So, but I'm an, an outsider to Catal, 
process. Yeah. So I have questions about the fundamental assumptions. So uh, the fact that CO is the rate limiting step, right? Yes. And that was found on copper surfaces. Is yeah. that simply true for, for all materials? It's a, a universal. You are asking all the right questions. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, let's go back to the CO mechanism. Um, there is a field, um, a subfield, but there may be three different ways of handling this problem. One is um, I am interested in a pure metal surface that I really, really care about, and I am going to try and build the right reaction network and come up with the right mechanism for that surface. So there is a um, there is a group of people who do nothing but think about how you enumerate reactions and then find what are the ones that are rate limiting and then focus your calculations and fitting on those things. That is the most detail oriented thing you can do. Okay. Um, the intermediate thing is you do calculations for every one of these steps on every pure metal surface, and then you try and find um, a correlation between every kinetic mod, every kinetic parameter here, and the simple descriptors on the surfaces like CO and hydrogen energies. And then you assume those scaling relations hold, and you solve the whole microkinetic problem. And um, because you are solving a, uh, you're calculating a different rate at every point, there actually is a different mechanism on different metals. You can switch between mechanisms. Um, that is like the intermediate one that works well for rationalizing pure metals, but uh, is super complicated to do for biometallics. Um, right now, no one can handle the question you're asking across anything that's more complicated than a pure metal surface without doing a lot of stuff by hand. What we need is we need, um, first of all, structural property relationships that make this process fast for an arbitrary surface so that it's not a three year PhD to come up with the mechanism, but it is like an automated process. There is a group um, at Sandia National Labs that is trying to do that. There's this open source code called RMGCAT um, uh, coming from the homogeneous catalysis literature or the gas based combustion literature. It's still super simple, but um, I think they're the right people looking at the problem. Um, I did a lot of work on reaction mechanism enumeration for selective chemistries. I haven't had any of my students do that because every one of these barrier steps takes like three weeks for a student to run. And I don't want to do that right now. Um, if these machine learning models, especially the machine learning potentials get fast enough, that could be fast. And then I would ask someone to go back and do it. If we could generate a data set that crossed lots of different possible intermediates and structures, and we could actually build a structure property relationship, I would also return to this problem. Uh, right now, um, there's, not a, there's not a choice. And you didn't even ask the real question of, um, I made an assumption here on which transition state scaling you choose. Okay. Uh, if it's on a step surface, it is more active or higher rates than on a flat surface. And so there's not even anything, like if you have a structured bimetallic, it's not super clear what, what scaling relation should apply to each site. I mean, that, that may be related to the other question I was going to ask, which is that you're concentrating on low index surfaces, right? Yes. And is it possible that a high index surface, even if it's a very small percentage oh, of yeah. the chiral nanoparticle, <laughs> is so active that it actually does There are so many interesting questions here. Okay. So if you're doing chiral surface chemistry, where your molecules are actually chiral, not all copper things are chiral, but copper, a really nice symmetric pure metal, you can actually get a chiral cut. So for example, um, 643 or 3171, are two Miller index um, Miller indices for upper surfaces. The um, the chirality effects are strong enough that the copper will actually rearrange to form those specific chiral surfaces. Um, I don't know how you come with three seventeen one. The guy who works next to me makes these like polished crystals and does these experiments. And um, yeah, I don't know how to solve that yet, but it is definitely possible. Um, for most of these simpler things, I don't think it's a problem. But it could happen. Yeah, it's yeah, super interesting. If you ask someone to make just the right crystal, maybe someone can do it too. Um, very, very quick final question. Um, I'll check if I missed it, but how do you handle in the workflow it just degrees of freedom from the point of view where you have a molecule? You know, how far away do you stop from the surface? How do you handle the rotation of the molecule? Like the thing with you, it's yeah. size, right? I get the impression you're doing a better job than we are right now. So, <laughs> yeah, um, that's why. Yeah. So we, we assume a fixed distance um, above the site. Um, I would say that it's a very poor assumption. Um, it works usually pretty okay. Um, I think we're wasting cycles doing this. Okay. Um, I have a student working on trying to predict relaxed structures. 
after you've done enough of these relaxations, but I haven't seen anyone like show a model that looks like that yet. But what I like dream scenario, someone has some machine learning method that looks at the initial structure and gives me a relaxed structure that is like three single points away from the real thing. That, that, that would be the dream. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>